Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Kim Johnson. I'm generally just hosting this. This is the second out of six in our webinar series. Um, we'll include more information on what's next at the end. And of course, you can follow us. I won't be a marketer if I didn't suggest you follow us on our social media platforms. We're live on YouTube today. We aren't really advertising it because this is the first time we're doing it. Um, but we will also post the recordings of each session we do on our YouTube page um, and, uh, and in other social media. So you can always find that in our past webinars on our YouTube page. Of course, it's a webinar. You guys can't yell at us, but you can chat to us. But I do want to request that um, you put your Q&A in the Q&A section. Um, that's kind of in that bar at the bottom. You should be able to type up your questions. Type them as you go if you'd like. Um, save them for the end. There is a nifty feature. You can upvote. So if you see a question you want answered, give that a thumbs up. It helps bump it to the top so that I can help prioritize um, the questions to answer for, for the whole crowd watching today. Um, I'm so glad you all got on fine. Uh, we had some technical difficulties yesterday. Looks like things are working smoothly today. Um, so hopefully you had no problems. So if you ever do, the goal now is to also have a live stream just in case if you can't, uh, can't get on, but looks like things are working. Um, and yeah, we're gonna try and answer as many questions as possible. Um, David's giving essentially a really brief snippet of what we cover in our normal Igor University training. So this is truly a 101 session. Um, I know I learn something every time I listen in. So now I'm going to introduce David briefly, and then I'll let him run with it um, until we get to the Q&A section. So feel free to chat with me or to put your questions in that Q&A, and I'm going to start watching that as we go. So before David starts, I just want to introduce him. Um, he's not someone you necessarily see in our social media or, or speaking at conferences as much, but he does a lot behind the scenes. He is our lighting project manager for Igor. He works closely with design and installation professionals around the world to design their projects with our technology. David, I know he's a firm believer as all of us at Igor is that once you have an Igor system installed, you really should have that as a backbone to integrate other technologies into your space. Today, we're gonna to focus on the basics, however, um, but you can certainly ask questions if anything inspires you. He joined Igor in the summer of 2017 um, and he has a very extensive background in architectural lighting. Uh, he actually earned a theatrical lighting degree from the University of Minnesota and had more than 30 years of a career in architectural lighting and controls field before joining Igor. So we're very lucky to have him. And with that, I want to turn it over to David Kane. David, would you take it away? I will. Thank you very much, Kim. Hey, I really appreciate you putting these series together and Hello, everyone. Appreciate you joining in today. Um, yeah, this is going to be a real high level uh, POE lighting 101, POE lighting design. I want to get everybody up to speed on the basics of POE quickly. So we're all on the same page. And then we're going to talk about um, the Igor technology, the Igor technology stack, what it takes to put a project together, and then the brains of the project, which are really the Igor nodes and what's all included in there. Um, we're gonna go through a couple different design examples and then yes, we're gonna open it up for questions so that we can get your questions answered and have this be um, very pertinent for you guys. So real quickly, um, just to get everybody up onto the same page, power over ethernet is a technology that's actually been out there for quite a while where we're actually able to carry power over the same cable um, as data. So for a long time, it's been used in voice over IP phones and Wi-Fi access points and IP security cameras and security systems, point of sale equipment. I know audio systems are also have been doing it. Um, and it's just been in the last handful of years that we've been able to add LED lighting uh, to that list as well. So there's a lot of benefits to POE. There's a huge cost savings. Um, no copper or conduit in the ceiling is required. There is a lower cost of labor because a lot of the labor is done by a low voltage installer. However, to those electricians out there, we still need you. Um, we're not replacing you by any means. Uh, there's still a ton of, of line voltage stuff to be had. Um, we're just um, redistributing where the wiring is going. 
but there is a huge cost savings uh, in the install. Uh, a lot of the integration involved, we can run power and data on the same cable, and that really is what creates the whole backbone of, of IoT and technology. Um, it is all plug and play and all to IEEE standards. The cable itself is a lot safer technically than line voltage cable and that uh, you're never gonna have more than 55 volts DC running through a cable. Um, it's easy to maintain and manage through your IT network and, and anywhere there's an ethernet connection, you're gonna be able to have power. So back in 2003, IEEE standard um, was at 15 watts uh, for PoE. Um, and back, you know, in 2003, I remember being real excited that lighting was, was roughly, you know, 40 lumens per watt. And we were real excited we could finally do LED and under cab lighting. Um, and look how far we've come. 2009, they upped the standard to a 30 watt standard. And that was able to start including maybe some down lights. Um, but as lighting is getting better, the efficacy of lighting is getting better and we're up to 100, 120 uh, lumens per watt. Now with the standards being 60 watt and now with, uh, within the last year, they've upped the standard to 90 watt. Um, that's an exciting, an exciting ability for us as designers to be able to, to truly see some efficiencies in being able to add lighting onto the PoE. Um, we're looking at standard CAT 5E and now with the 90 watt, we're suggesting CAT 6 cable. And we'll talk a little bit about how that all happens. Um, 30 and 60 watt is all achieved over the two pair, 60 watt over the four pair. And then when we run up to CAT 6, <clears throat> we can do 60 watt with the CAT 6 and definitely we do the 90 watt. So here's the Igor technology stack. So here's the 10,000 foot view of, of how the Igor system works. We start with the cloud portal at the top, which is you can access from your phone, basically any browser. So your phone, your desktop, your laptop. Um, and here, based on your system, you're gonna be able to access energy analytics. You're gonna be able to access all the different buildings that are in your system. Uh, you could actually drill down to the room level and be able to change the lighting, change the color of the lighting, um, just all of the data that's gonna be flowing through the system, <clears throat> you're gonna be able to access through the portal. In our gateway, <clears throat> our gateway is our software and our UI, our user interface that, that is what you're actually gonna see and interact with. Um, there's just a slew of different data points and information that you're gonna be able to gather through our UI. Um, we also, uh, definitely are what we call an open architecture company and you'll find that throughout where we really encourage other companies to uh, join in and we welcome uh, <clears throat> their input. So we have an open API and anybody is welcome to uh, write API and write command strings uh, in order to customize what they're seeing in their uh, user interface. We also talk BACnet over IP so we can easily interface with building management systems, HVAC, um, and we'll get in a little further down about a lot of the other um, different section um, sensors that we can interface with. We then will talk to some kind of power sourcing equipment, a PSE. <clears throat> Sometimes people call it a network switch. That's gonna be from a variety of different partners. Um, we can either do what's called a UPOE, which is a switch that combines both the power and the data in one switch, or we could use what's called a mid-span, which is where you've got the power coming out of one piece of equipment and then another data switch that would house the data as well. <clears throat> you are able to carry both the power that's powering the, the LED light fixtures and the data that's streaming back and forth all on the same cable, all at the same time. And the brains to the whole unit is the Igor node. We have a couple different nodes we're gonna go over in a minute, um, but the node is really what replaces the driver in the LED fixture. It carries the brains and the programming, and it's the collection point for all of the sensors um, and devices that we're gonna put onto the system. And then again, the low voltage devices um, being third party, we talk with many other people's sensors um, a milieu of 
light fixtures, wall controls, plug load control, motorized shades, uh, and we're going to get into a long list of a lot of the low voltage devices that we can talk to. So here is one of our nodes. This is what we call our Rev5 node. It's about the size of a deck of cards. This one comes in three different versions, a max, mid, and min. And as we go up the line from the min up, it adds more and more features. So um, first of all, this is what we call a network node. So the yellow RJ45 port that says PoE will sense power and this will then have a, an RJ45 ethernet cable that'll run back to the power sourcing equipment. So this is where the power is gonna come. This is made to, to land one light fixture, a positive and a negative. So one LED channel <clears throat> on this node. This node would be originally designed to mount inside a fixture. And so this would power the fixture itself. Again, it would replace the LED driver. And then the two RJ45s would be exposed so that you could plug in the PoE RJ45 to go back to your power sourcing equipment. And then the blue Igor RJ45 is what we call our daisy chain um, port. And that's where we're gonna be able to really um, access some economies of scale and be able to daisy chain fixtures together uh, to take advantage of some of those 60 and 90 watt opportunities. When we get into the mid um, node, we've got a whole uh, milieu of wall switch opportunities over here. We can do up to a five button wall switch with LED uh, indicator lights on each of the buttons. Um, here it's showing we can do uh, two different types of aux sensors and a, there's a 24 volt su uh, power supply there as well. And then this again has one LED channel. As we move up to the max node, which is the most popular, we add all of those. We have the five button up to a five button wall control, but now we're adding four channels of lighting as well. So you could have four different light fixtures wired to this one node, all independently controllable, as long as they don't exceed, in this case, it would be 54 watts. Uh, we go for 60 watts and we'll get into some of the wattage limitations uh, as, we, as we go further. Uh, we also add a couple relay ports on, on the max node. Um, and that also allows us to control a bunch of different kinds of relays so that we can control some fixtures that we're just going to switch on and off. Um, also remember that a, a static light fixture is going to be a two wire. So this will be one LED fixture, one LED channel, and that's going to be static color. If we do tunable white, which we do often, um, that's going to be two channels. So the max node could handle two tunable fixtures in that it's going to take two channels for each fixture. Um, or we could handle four individual fixtures. The device nodes are identical to the network nodes, except they have two blue Igor RJ45 ports. So if you plug power into this, nothing's gonna happen. This doesn't have the ability to sense power or to give power, um, but it can um, distribute power uh, and daisy chain into a system. So this would then go up to the next node, which eventually would be up to a network node. And we'll show how many of those we can put in a run as well. We also have a, a UL924, which is the uh, UL listing for emergency lighting. We are listed uh, with a, a long list of UL listings. One of them is the UL924 emergency lighting. We have emergency nodes so that in the system, um, the power fails, we're having power sourcing equipment that's backed up by inverters, by batteries, by generators. And those power sourcing equipment that are backed up will be feeding these emergency nodes. And when this loses the heartbeat, and we'll get into this in a minute, um, from the server to say, hey, I've, I've lost power, these nodes know to go into emergency mode. So kind of as a quick summary, the Rev5 nodes have, the MAX has four LED channels a dry contact and a 24 volt aux sensor input, uh, four analog inputs, and two relays, and we can control up to a five button wall control with the LED lights included. This is our Rev6 node. This is about the size of a T5HO ballast or an LED driver. Uh, this was originally designed 
to again be mounted in a fixture. But then once we really got it out in the field and started working with it, we realized all the opportunities for mounting this outside the fixture as well. All of our nodes are UL listed and plenum rated so that they can be either in or outside the fixture, it doesn't matter. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to both that we'll talk about when we get into some of the design. The uh, max version of the Rev6 node has two LED channels for lighting, so you can do either two static colors of light or you could do one tunable light fixture. We have three inputs for sensors and actually you could land switches here without LEDs on the buttons uh, and a power port if we wanted to extend uh, PoE power to another device. On the Rev6 node, we've now added a USB port and an RS-485 and that opens up an entire universe where we can now interface with just a slew of other sensors um, that are then gonna be powered with the USB and the RS-485. And that's what's gonna, those are the keys to getting those on our system. Uh, the Rev6 node also does have the um, Igor and the PoE RJ45 ports there on the bottom. We have an emergency version of the same, uh, which has the same UL924 listing. The um, Rev5 node, we'll go into this a little bit later, the Rev5 node is the 60 watt node and the Rev6 node is our 90 watt node. So two LED channels on the Rev6 node, three dry, dry contact closures um, or, and or a zero to 10 volt. The wall switch inputs would be handled by these three dry contact closures. There's a USB connection and the RS-485. So how does the emergency work? We talked a little bit about that the, the nodes get a heartbeat from the server every second. And if the node all of a sudden realizes that, hey, it's been five seconds and I haven't seen a heartbeat, if it's an emergency node, it goes into emergency mode and it'll turn the lights on to a designated setting. It can be 100%, it can be 50. Um, some municipalities are requiring that all your lights go up to 100%. In, a, in the case of a power outage, and some municipalities require a one foot candle evenly distributed across the space. So we can work with any of those and that 100% is programmable in the software. Um, when the heartbeat signal is reestablished, the node will return back to normal operation. So when it's in emergency mode, um, none of the switches will work, none of the wall controls um, or the sensors uh, we'll turn the lights on or off. They will be on until it hears the heartbeat and the heartbeat gets reestablished. So the whole emergency concept can be worked a few different ways. We can work off a central generator so that the building has an inverter or a battery backup system. Um, we'll probably have some kind of UPS in the, in the data closet, the IDF as well, to help bridge that gap between the moment the power goes out and a couple minutes later when um, the generator kicks in. Um, but we could easily uh, work off of that. The, the um, generator will then power a specific network switch, which then all of the emergency nodes are wired to that network switch. Uh, we often also will do a, what we call a distributed backup system where either the inverter or a battery backup is in each data closet. And so then it's the same concept where those inverters or those batteries are powering a specific uh, network switch and that the uh, emergency nodes are, are wired into that specific network switch. And then we're just gonna have a series of those throughout the building in each of the data closets. Um, soon, coming soon, uh, Igor is coming up with its own onboard battery backup. Um, it will be hooked into the Rev6 node and it's currently at UL um, being tested and being listed. So it's still slated, we're guessing still for 2020, um, but we won't put a specific date on it, but it is something that's coming and, and uh, on the drawing board. So like I said, the Rev5 node is a 60 watt per port design. So if you just have one node in your, um, in your run, you could have up to 54 watts on a node. So we, we designed the 60 watt system for 54 watts to account for 
a little bit of line loss and the sensors each take about a note or so uh, or a watt or so. Um, and if there's anything else on the line, um, it just gives us a little bit of buffer. If you've got two fixtures you want to power, you could do two fixtures at 27 watts each. You could daisy chain these nodes together. One node would go off to the power source equipment and then it would feed the 54 watts to these two nodes. You could have three nodes in your run, three light fixtures each at 18 watts a piece. You could have four fixtures at 13 watts a piece or you could do five fixtures um, at 10 watts a piece. So if you had 10 watt down lights, you could do five 10 watt down lights on one network home run. <clears throat> and you'll see as we get further into the design, the real cost savings and efficiencies come when we can make the most out of our network switch and, and limit the number of ports and home runs <clears throat> that we really have. And this daisy chaining is something that's very unique uh, to Igor. No one else is doing this. And then the 90 watt per port is truly a game changer and that's a, another gimme or gotcha for, for Igor. Um, no one else yet is doing the, the 90 watt or working with the 90 watt um, uh, new exceptions, new limitations. We're going for 80 watts on a 90 watt run, again, for some line loss and for some sensors. Um, the Rev6 node can handle um, 72 watts on either or each of the two ports, not to exceed 80 watts across the whole node. So we could do two 40 watt two by twos, for instance, in an office, and where we used to have to run a home run for each 40 watt fixture, now we can do um, one home run and daisy chain those two fixtures together. They could each be um, 140, or they could each be 40 watts each. And then if we had three fixtures, you could do 26 watts. There's a lot of two by twos at 25 watts now, um, where we used to maybe be able to do two of those on a home run on a 60 watt system. With the 90 watt, now we can do three. And that's gonna start saving um, drops and install, and, and we're gonna show you an example in a minute of, of the real advantages to the 90 watt system. <clears throat> with four uh, Rev6 nodes, you can go basically 20 watts a fixture, and with five Rev6 nodes in the run, you could do 16 watts a fixture. So what I want to show you is an example of some of the, the true efficiencies of using a 90-watt system um, versus a 60-watt. What I've got here is, a, is an AGI layout that I did showing a basic space, just an open office, 75 by 150, let's say a 10 foot ceiling, and I want 40 foot candles across the space. Um, so 40 foot candles with a standard two by two fixture, I'm gonna need to do an eight by 10 spacing. So these fixtures are spaced eight foot vertically and 10 foot horizontally apart. Um, and this is gonna give me roughly 40 foot candles across the space. <clears throat> if I were to be able to up the wattage of that fixture, because of the 90 watt design, I'm gonna be able to spread my fixtures apart a little bit more and use less fixtures. So I'm gonna be able to go to a 10 by 12 layout in this instance and still maintain my 40 foot candles across the space. So here in the eight by 10 layout at 60 watts, I've got 135 fixtures in that layout at 25 watts each at 3,100 lumens. So I'm gonna have 68 home runs being able to daisy chain two of those on each network home run. In the 10 by 12 layout at 90 watts, I'm able to do that same lighting for 91 fixtures. I am gonna up the wattage to 38 watts because I'm gonna up to 5,000 lumens so I can spread them a little bit further apart. But even two fixtures to a run allows me to get it down to 46 home runs. Somebody in one of my classes said, well, what if I can't change the eight by 10 layout, but I still want to go with the 90 watt concept? I said, well, let's, let's look at that. So I still have the 135 fixtures, but now instead of two fixtures per run, I can go three fixtures per run at 75 watts and get that down to 45 home runs. So I'll show you in a second where that really translates into dollars. So I also wanted to show you just the foot candles. I've got 39.98 in the 10 by 12 spacing. I have 38.09 average in the eight by 10 spacing. So in both applications, I'm still hitting my, basically my 40 foot candles at desktop. So here's the dollar figures of how that works out. Um, in the 60 watt design, 135 fixtures. Um, I've got, I'm using here mid spans and data switches as one example. 
So uh, patch panels, and then a rough estimate on install labor at $250 a drop. It varies by area. Um, parts of the East and West Coast may be more, parts of the Midwest may be less. So the $250 a drop is a pretty good average. <clears throat> so with 68 drops, that 135 fixtures in that eight by 10 design is gonna cost roughly $60,000 to install. Then if I wanna keep the same eight by 10 layout, but I can go to the 90 watt design, I still have the 135 fixtures, but I can use a little bit different configuration on the mid spans. And the biggest cost savings is that I've only got 45 drops at $250 a drop. So I'm actually gonna be saving a little over $7,000 or 18% simply by going to that 90 watt design. If I can utilize um, a higher wattage fixture and really spread those out and only do 91 fixtures, my fixture cost went up a little bit because it's a higher lumen uh, fixture, but um, I'm really saving it in the install. So here we're finding because of the equipment and because of the lesser install, I'm actually able to save a little over $15,000 or 26% over the traditional. What we're truly finding is that um, depending on the, the, um, the level of integration with all the different sensors and switches involved, uh, we're finding that a PoE install can run anywhere between 14 and 35-ish, 35, 40% savings over a traditional uh, line voltage install. <clears throat> so as we're daisy chaining fixtures together, we have the options, and this holds true for both the um, Rev5 and the Rev6 nodes. So you can do up to five nodes in a chain, all running off to one network home run. And then on those five nodes, you can put your relays and your sensors and your lights and your shades and your switches, and you can load all of these nodes up. <clears throat> Our software parameters show that we can run five nodes and up to 32 devices on one network home run. So again, we talked about where the cost savings really comes in is, is um, being the most efficient with your network home runs. And so you can put up to 32 devices on a network home run and all 32 devices are individually addressable and individually programmable in the software. So regardless of where you have switches and shades and lights and sensors and relays on these nodes, Every light and every shade and every switch and every sensor are all individually programmable within the software. We have some different design techniques and strategies for where the nodes go. Um, initially, they were designed to be integral to the fixture. And so that you, the, the nodes would come out of the factory, out of the light fixture factory with the nodes installed. Since it replaces the LED driver, um, it'll be in the fixture and what will be exposed will be the RJ45 ports, the in and the out. So the advantage is that it's going to be more plug and play. It's going to be simple for someone to install, hang the fixture, bring the RJ45 Ethernet cable, plug it in, and the fixture can be up and running. Um, what we found as we started to design more and more jobs is that there are times when we may want to field mount the node so that the fixture will come from the factory with just two leads out of it and that we're going to um, probably mount the node to the back of the fixture and wire it up that way. What that allows us to do then is also then bring in all of the sensors and auxiliary devices and wire it into the node because now it'll be accessible. Um, and a third design strategy is called remote noting where we're literally mounting the node to the ceiling or in a box um, or on the cable. I've seen many different ways of mounting it. And then we're wiring multiple fixtures to one node and bringing um, sensors and switches and wall controls all to the same node in order to make everything more efficient. When we talk about the load voltage devices, um, we can talk occupancy sensors and light sensors and temp and humidity and air quality and motorized shades, gunshot detection, people counting, asset tracking, and I'm sure there's going to be more. Um, none of this is proprietary. This is all others, other people's sensors and switches. Um, we have a long list of compatible devices and we have someone back at the office and their job is solely to test um, new product and hardware and test its compatibility 
and create diagrams of what it would take for us to be able to integrate with that product. So here you're seeing, for instance, a watt stopper wall control and a Hubble or Leviton um, a ceiling ox sensor and a Leviton daylight harvesting. Um, we're working with a whole slew of different companies. We have a partnership with, with um, Sumfi right now for motorized shades. And so um, we really pride ourselves on, on open architecture technology. <clears throat> Our wall controls, um, we have a, a Pass and Seymour Legrand simple rocker switch that we can do for just an on off. Um, we have a couple different manufacturers that we work with multi button switches. We can go from one button all the way up to 10 button in a single gang. Um, switch that either have to be wired or we have one version that has an RJ45 on the back, so it's plug and play. And new to the team is a new touchscreen. And so the touchscreen control now um, can be programmed with uh, a number of different uh, facilities and buttons. Um, our latest uh, touchscreen that I'm, I'm quoting now is going to be, um, it's going to have lights and shades and temp control all on the same screen. And we could put the company's logo on the back. And so these are all customizable. So those are going to be um, a very cool new addition. So just some of the partners that we work with in the, in the whole open architecture ecosystem, you see some lighting manufacturers, some sensor manufacturers. Um, and this is just a handful of them. There, there are more. And uh, every, every week we're actually getting requests from different manufacturers to, to come play nice. And so we love to uh, invite other manufacturers to the party and, and see how we can work together. A Couple of these manufacturers we actually are OEMing for. If you've ever seen anything from Hubble Power Hub, um, that's all Igor technology and Igor hardware uh, inside the Hubble fixtures that we're white labeling for them. So, I'm sure a lot of you have seen a traditional line voltage install um, with all the different conduit and wires in the ceiling, zero to 10 volt controls and power pack for sensors, um, junction boxes and lighting interface modules, another lighting interface controller to a breaker box, dedicated server is gonna be somewhere and, and somewhere controlling the lighting controller. So it ends up getting messy and, and there's a lot going on. With a PoE installation, it's Cat5 cables. And if you're ever in our office, actually we have panels in the ceiling so you can see the cables up above and see that um, there's no copper or conduit in the ceiling. It's all ethernet cables. And we can land the sensors and the wall controls and the light fixtures um, and everything that's going on that's in the backbone of IoT is all gonna be running on these ethernet cables that are all gonna go back to a PoE switch in the closet. So from a 10,000 foot view, we've got our light fixtures on the bottom here coming up with the node attached, either a home run to, this is showing a power injector, which is a mid-span, or these two devices could be one, uh, UPOE, so it's power and data. Here we're showing a daisy chain of two fixtures and then one home run. And then invariably there's gonna be closets from floor two and floor three that are all gonna be running into one network switch. We have our eGuard gateway, which is either a small form factor computer or a server that's running our software that's going to tell all the light fixtures what to do when and receive all the signals, and a DHCP server, which is going to be running the heartbeat out to the nodes. So I've got a little wiring example in CAD to show. I can pull it in here. So let's just look at a simple office, um, two, two by two, static color, uh, 25 watts each with an occupancy sensor and a five button wall control. So pretty basic office. What would we do to wire that up? Um, so with integral nodes, we would have a network node in one fixture. We would have a device node in this other fixture. And then I would have another device node out here <clears throat> that would be handling, picking up the aux sensor and the five button switch. And the reason I do that is because if the nodes are integral in the fixture, I'll have access to the RJ45 ports, but I won't have access to the IO ports on the side um, of the nodes. So we're gonna have uh, ethernet wiring from the node to the node, and then again from the 
device node to the network node, and then from the network node, run to the IDF for the data closet. We're then going to have sensor wiring. So this is going to be um, probably four conductor, 22, six ga 22 gauge and six wire. So you can just run a 22 six from the aux sensor itself to the node. And then the wall station wiring, actually a five button is actually a 12 conductor. So you'd need two 22 sixes um, running to that node. So this is one easy configuration of how to how to wire and how to design that office. We can do that whole office with one home run, in this case, three nodes <clears throat> and two devices. So is there a simpler way? Yes, there's always a simpler way. So if we decide that we want to do um, remote nodes, as we talked about, we could look at doing this. So we have one Rev5 network max remote node in the room and we're gonna wire everything to the node. So each fixture is gonna go to the um, LED channels on the bottom of the node. The aux sensor wires into this side, the five button control wires into that side. And with one node, we are now um, designing this entire space and utilizing one home run, 50 watts. Um, and this makes it truly simple. So the difference is gonna be um, can we get the electrician to wire this or do we need it to be plug and play? Are the nodes coming from the factory or are the nodes um, going to be remote? So there's a lot of things that go into it as we're um, working up the design. So speaking of the design, anybody that's out there that's been doing lighting design or any kind of, of blueprints and design understand that your design layouts your voice. Um, and when I do a, a lighting design or when I do a, a network design, a POE design, um, that's me out there in the field. So it needs to be clear and concise. It needs to get through and communicate what it is I want done. Um, and so we've developed some standards. There's a legend um, for nodes and wiring on top of the lighting legend and, and anything else. We've developed a, a, an Igor node legend that I put on all my plans. I will often um, amend the fixture schedule and talk about if the nodes are integral or remote, which shows who's responsible for them when, and make sure that you've got the wattage per fixture or even more important, the wattage per length with all the linear fixtures that we're working with these days. Um, we're gonna be able to uh, calculate how many nodes we're gonna need. So if you have a long run of fixtures and it exceeds what the wattage requirement is uh, or ability for a node, we may have multiple nodes in that run. So we want to identify and create a device and sensor legend so we know what sensors we're looking at. Um, it's often the case that the lighting is on one plan and the sensors and devices may be on another plan and plug load control may be on a third. And what's unique about PoE is that we're actually going to pull all of those things together so that all of those devices and, and IOT all come together onto one backbone. And so we're gonna put them all on one plan and it, you'd think it gets messy, um, but we've got to figure out ways to communicate that clearly. Um, I've got a few design do's and don'ts. Um, I had somebody that was working and thought they'd give a, a design plan a shot. So this was what they came up with and sent it to me for review. And I said, I honestly couldn't tell an electrician how this had to be wired. And you can't really decide based on how you're seeing your wire runs go, um, what's supposed to go to what and what fixtures go to what node. So it's important to be clear on what fixtures go to what node and in your wire runs clearly design and clearly show what fixtures are located and what fixtures are, are daisy chained into what into what node. Here's another example of, oops, um, I'm not sure how I'd be able to explain this to an electrician if he called, when really, if you took a minute, it would just be a little simpler in the design. So your plans are your communication, uh, make sure they're clear and concise. So that's a 10,000 foot view of POE lighting design. I really appreciate you guys coming today and, and joining in. Um, Next week, um, our director of, of hardware development, Andrew Pospisil, is going to be talking about hardware 101 
Um, and that's going to be an exciting webinar to, to sit in on as well. So thank you very much. And, and Kim, I think we're ready for some questions. And do we have a lot of questions? So um, thank you, David, for the presentation. Um, just to address a few things, yes, the recording will be up on YouTube. We will also, I'll work with David to pull out some of these slides. So when we send you all a thank you email for attending, you can get um, some PDFs of what we talked about today as well. Um, and remember, put your questions in the Q&A section. We're going to do our best to answer them. We're going to try and prioritize the ones that get the upvotes and the ones related to lighting design. Um, as uh, David said, next week is all about hardware. If we missed your question, it's hardware related. If you register for next week's seminar um, webinar, we'll be sure to look at those questions in advance or share them um, when you join next week. Uh, OK, so the most popular question, David. What is the maximum distance between a fixture and a remote node? Fixture and a remote node, we'd like to keep at, um, again, there's, there's um, voltage drop charts on our spec sheets, but a, a, a high level rule is about 100 feet. Um, the PoE standard still holds true from the power source to the node. So that's the uh, 100 meter rule or 300 feet. But if we're remote noting a fixture from the node to the fixture, uh, we'd like to keep that at about 100 foot. Great. Carl Griffith, hi. Uh, he asks, how do I get UL approval with the driver removed so that I can add the node either remote or inside the fixture? Do you have some insight on that at all, David? UL listing 2108 is the low voltage UL listing that um, allows you to uh, deliver a fixture with just two leads out and without a driver. It's the low voltage listing. And um, if you have a fixture that's UL2108, you're able to ship it without a driver. And then we're able to connect to it in the field with a remote node. Thank you. Um, Fitz is asking a question about saving money using POE. So he asks specifically, do you have a sell sheet on the money saved on installation by using a POA system? Um, and I will answer that we have one pretty good concrete example, um, and that's a good idea. I might actually attach that in the thank you email so you all can have a look at it. Um, but did you want to talk, David, a little bit more? I think really a few questions have been around saving money installing PUE versus line voltage. If you just want to comment a little bit on what you've seen. Yeah, it's... Um... It's kind of tricky. We, I spent a year um, researching RS means to try and do some data comparisons between line voltage systems and PoE systems. Um, it's, it's so new out there that the electricians uh, and the low voltage installers are just getting their feet wet to try and, and get their economies of scale up and running so that they can be more efficient out there. Um, overall, we, the reports that we're seeing and the feedback we're getting is showing that PoE um, overall tends to be, like I said, about 15 to 35% cheaper to install. Uh, and then there's uh, additional cost savings uh, over the life of the system as well because of our ability to tune into sensors better. And with the data that we're getting back on the backbone, uh, we're able to control the lighting better by tuning the sensors to a more efficient scale. Thank you. Sean asks, is the gateway software to run on a computer, PC only, or can it run on a mini, a Mac mini, for example? Not sure if you know this one or if this is for Andrew. I'm guessing it could run on a Mac mini. Um, I do know that our software can run on virtually anybody else's um, system. Um, the little nook that we often use is just an Intel nook, which is our little mini form mm -hmm. factor. Um, and so our, our gateway software runs on that. So if we have a system that is actually less than about 800 devices, so devices are light fixtures and sensors and switches. So if we have a system that's less than 800 devices, we can run it on a little mini Intel Nook. And uh, so it doesn't take much overhead at all. All right, um, we've got one. I'm gonna take just one of Carl's right now. Uh, Carl Griffith submitted a couple. Um, he's asking, will most LED manufacturers provide me a fixture with no driver? Um, and then he's wondering of both constant current or constant voltage. Carl, I'm not sure what you mean by that last bit. I can, I'll take it. 
Do you? Okay. Yep, I got it. Got it. So um, it, it requires a conversation. Um, initially, fixture manufacturers were really hesitant to send out a fixture without a driver. Um, more and more are doing it. And as we're having um, more and more conversations and partnerships developing with the fixture manufacturers, they're understanding what we're doing. And then, yes, we're able to get the fixture manufacturers to ship their fixtures, less drivers. Currently, all of our nodes are constant current. We do have a constant voltage node in development. Um, I actually saw a 3D image, 3D printing of the actual shell of what it's going to be. Um, and we're hoping that within the next 10 to 12 months, it's going to be something that we'll be able to be to have commercially developed. Um, but there is a constant voltage node in the 90 watt form factor uh, in, in the works. But right now we're running on constant current. If we run into a fixture that is constant voltage, uh, we have a couple different options right now. We can uh, connect it to a relay and shut it on and off and, con and control it on the PoE system that way. Um, or we've also just developed an interface to zero to 10 volt control. And so we could control it that way as well. Great. All right, uh, James Frey is asking, how about integration with wireless sensors, um, like cloud to cloud connections? You wanna talk about wireless sensors? You know, we've done a little, currently we really don't have anything that's ready for prime time. Um, we've done a little bit of work with InOcean. Um, and so we've played a little bit with some wireless, but right now that's not something that's, that's on our board. Okay. Uh, George asks, do nodes need, in parentheses, NEMA enclosure, like ballast and LED drivers? Okay, they do not. Um, they are rated, they're plenum rated. And so they can be mounted uh, on the back of ceiling tiles. I've seen them mounted on the grid rail in a drop ceiling. I've seen them actually mounted to the aircraft cable that's supporting the grid rail. They can be mounted to the ceiling. Um, so no. Uh, Nodes can be mounted out in the open, in the ceiling, in the plenum, anywhere you can find space. Um, does shade control connection, does our shade control connection both control and power the shades? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we have, um, our partnership with Sumfi has actually now created a direct connection from Sumfi shades into our software. Um, we used to have to use a node as the interface um, for powering and now we've developed a new, um, basically new interface. So the Sumfi gateway goes right into the power source equipment and lives on our network. If we're doing uh, Meco shades, for instance, uh, we could do that with uh, a node as the interface, but yes, then it would be both power and control. All right, uh, next question from Kyron Griffith. Can you describe how switches and wall controls are integrated into the system? Do they connect via wires into the node or can they be connected via RJ45s? Yes. Um, uh, rocker switch and uh, many of the button controls are uh, hardwired with 22 gauge wire to a node. There is one set of switches that H.E. Williams has developed for us where they took the, the uh, printed circuit board from one of our nodes and embedded it in the back of their switch. And so they've kind of combined the best of both worlds and created a one all the way up to 10 button switch in a single gang control with an RJ45 out of the back of it. And so then that one just has to piggyback um, into a node so that it just lands on the system. So that's a nice version of a plug and play wall control. Um, so we've got a couple more questions here. Um, I mean, I'm just going to use up your time, David. Let's see that's, what we're doing. <laughs> that's fine. I'm here. How long is the standard UTP cable run to get to an 80 watt run? Carl thought that they were limited to about 72 watts at 100 meters. The answer is going to be it depends on the diameter of the cable. Obviously, the, the smaller the gauge, the farther you can run, which is why CAT6 is recommended for 90 watt, um, because it's besides the heat dissipation, um, you're going to be better off with that longer run. Um, we haven't found any much of any uh, line loss in running even um, 80 watt runs. and 
all of that data is actually um, on the last page, I think it is, of our, of our node spec sheets. Um, there's cable drop and cable run information based on length and wattage. All right. Orlando is asking, in the event that the gateway loses connection to the network, will the nodes still be able to operate independently or do the nodes require constant contact for their intelligence? The nodes are going to do a couple different things. If they lose the connection to the gateway, but they still have power, they're going to go into an offline mode, in which case um, they're still going to work, but they're going to lose their ability to be controlled by the local controls. If they lose power, then the lights go out and then emergency nodes will be supplied power by some kind of emergency battery backup system, which will then power the emergency lighting in the space. All right, I'm trying to scroll and see if we've got some really related to lighting design here. Um, so from James, he's asking, how do the on-site wiring technicians handle the field wiring intricacies? Are there a way to connectorize the IO to a node? Again, maybe that's a hardware question, but do your best, David. <laughs> there is. Um, we've had one job in particular where they truly wanted a plug and play application. And we developed um, some little custom, what we call dongles, so that there were RJ45s coming off of the node rather than hardwiring them in. And so then that created a, a node that was truly plug and play. Um, so yeah, there are ways that we can do it. Um, it's definitely, let's talk about that at the beginning of the design process. And um, integral nodes are another way that makes it easier because um, then you're really just daisy chaining nodes together. Um, so that can be that can be handled a few different ways, but let's talk about that early and yeah, we can accommodate that. All right, Scott McClintock is wondering, how is dimming achieved? That's gonna be a better question for Andrew next week with, with the hardware, but I can tell you that we can dim, um, the nodes can dim down to actually less than 1%. So as you're looking at all the different dimming drivers out there and everybody's saying I can dim to 10% or I can dim to 5%, Igor nodes can actually dim down to less than 1%. Ane is wondering, can you zone luminaires from different nodes together? Yes, very much so. So while the fixtures are um, individually um, addressable in the software, we have what are called spaces in our software. And so you group fixtures together in spaces and then you can um, literally assign that space um, some kind of event um, and then you can assign that to a button so that a button's going to do anything in particular and so a button could do an individual load it could be what we think of as a preset and and the developers called action sets um, and so uh, virtually it's all just a matter of software and another beauty to the PoE system as well where you're going to save a lot of money is if you ever reconfigure your space tear down walls, all of a sudden you decide that this area of the open office is now going to be a conference room. Um, there's no rewiring that has to be done in the space. It's all just a matter of, of reprogramming uh, what lights go to what buttons and what controls and all of a sudden all your, all your lights are now regrouped for the new office space. It, Rick is wondering, is there a power draw factor that needs to be calculated for the other devices other than lights that need to be considered? We kind of assume that sensors take a watt or less. Um, if there's something in particular that we think is going to be a heavy power draw, we'll work that into our calculations. Um, uh, my design software helps calculate how much wattage or what the wattage is per run. Um, so if we've got a, a particular device that's, that's watt heavy, uh, we'll calculate that. But for the most part, Ox sensors and switches, even ones with LED um, indicators are, are pulling less than a watt each. All right, apologies about the background noise if there is any. Um, we've got a question wondering about how is a lighting designer's control plans shared with the commissioning team? So 
maybe any best practices you have on yeah how so the best practices are by the time we get to the commissioning stage there will be a, a lighting plan that shows um, a wiring diagram that shows where all the network home runs are and what fixtures are connected to what nodes so that when the commissioning agent comes in and begins to set up spaces they're going to know what lights to expect in what space and by looking at a sequence of operations they're going to be able to understand how the sensors and switches are going to react and what they're expected to do based on the space that they're in Great. Um, what type of topology are you using in the 90 watt node? So I'm guessing you're going to, you're looking at um, like star or T-tap or really um, it's more, I guess what we'd call a daisy chain technology. So if you're daisy chaining nodes together, it's it's a um, it's a jumper cable, an RJ five RJ forty five jumper cable from node to node, and if you're wiring fixtures to it, um, you're you're um, directly wiring a light fixture to either LED channel one or two on the node. So if you get into st if you start getting into um, serial wiring, um, we start running into some issues with some um, milliamp overages and so I we we try not to, we try to not uh, wire light fixtures in series we really uh, recommend that you would do parallel wiring all right we're getting close to the end here um, any final thoughts on best practices for people designing PoE lighting David um, keep it simple um, keep your plans concise um, there, there are ways and, and um, conventions, I guess you would say, to, to um, communicate what it is you're trying to do. But, you know, truly realize that if you were to give your plans to someone that wasn't familiar with the industry, would they be able to kind of figure out what went with what? And I kind of feel like the, your plans need to be able to reflect that. Well, thank you so much, David, and thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, this will it be recorded. It will be up on YouTube for repeat watching. Um, stay tuned for future webinars. Some of these questions I'm actually going to share with some of our upcoming speakers um, because they might be really well suited to some of our future speakers as well. So thank you all for your time today. Um, we'll send you an email uh, with uh, with the recording and some other information we talked about today um, in a couple of days. So give us a little bit of time. Um, but David, thank you once again. This was Thank you, everyone. Um, we had some great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. There were just too many. But thank you as well to the audience members here who replied to each other's questions. Um, your perspectives are really helpful. This is a collaborative industry. So once again, thank you. And thank you, David. And uh, have a great day, everyone.